Welcome everyone um, to today's webinar. My name is Michelle Rapp. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Career Strategy in the Office of Alumni Relations. And I'm really happy to have Jen McDuffie here with us. This is her third time presenting an alumni career webinar. So back by popular demand. And obviously we're in a time of great change as well as opportunity with many people reevaluating their careers and their jobs and making changes. I'm excited to have Jen McDuffie here to show us how to create ultra efficient and effective job search processes that tap into unconventional methods for securing your next role and helping you be competitive in the job search marketplace. Jen is the managing director of the Resume Chick and Co, a boutique resume writing firm that specializes in creating unique marketing documents. Jen is a certified professional resume writer who also made her mark as vice president of the National Association of African American Resume Writers. She has led and influenced hundreds of employees and spent over 20,000 hours dedicated to hiring, coaching, training, and mentoring teams in her work at State Farm Insurance. She's a proud double Husky who graduated with honors and earned an MS in corporate and organizational communications with a specialization in leadership, as well as a BS in technical communication. Jen, thanks so much for being here today. And we look forward to hearing your tips and practices. Awesome. Okay, can, you, can everyone hear me? We're good? Yes, okay, perfect. All right, so welcome to Three Ways to Thrive in a Crowded Job Search Marketplace. Um, of course, Michelle already introduced me. I'm Jen, owner and chief of TRC. I've been in career services for about 20 years, and my favorite part is always sharing my knowledge with anyone who will listen. <laughs> so what I want you to take away from this seminar are three concepts. We're going to talk about the hidden job market, what it is, why it's important, where it is, and how to get in. We're going to talk about customizing your resume for each role, how to read a job description, um, applicant tracking software rules and keywords. We're going to also talk about running your job search as a marketing campaign. Um, we're gonna determine how much time you wanna spend applying for a new position. So kind of looking at a schedule, um, identifying of course your target audience, um, developing your media strategy or your job search strategy, um, creating your message, or enhancing your career profile, um, implementing your marketing campaign, and of course, measuring and analyzing your results. So there are six essential steps to winning a marketing campaign, which is to uh, determine your objective, of course, in your budget, identify your target audience, again, create your message, develop your media strategy, implement your marketing campaign, and measure and analyze your results. So you're going to see, I'm going to be drawing some parallels between the two. We're going to use kind of the same concept in the job search marketing campaign as we would in a regular marketing campaign. So I wanted to let you guys know that each segment is going to be interactive. We're gonna have three segments. So feel free to comment as you go and ask questions. Um, and Caesar's gonna be keeping track of those questions. And then we'll talk about, we'll do a Q&A at the end of the call. All right, so there we go. All right, so we'll talk about some key takeaways. Um, remember the focus of course is treating your job search like a marketing campaign. So for instance, in marketing, you have exp um, exploring different channels, sorry. For us, it, that's gonna be exploring the hidden job market. Second is gonna be key findings. So it's what info do you have? What info do you need? And what do you do with the info once you get it? Um, third marketing reference is how brands work online. So that's enhancing your online presence, for instance, on LinkedIn. And then we're gonna talk about customize your research for each role. And I'm gonna show you some tips from the experts. So that's gonna be, it's gonna be pretty cool. So hang with me. Um, we're gonna talk about tailoring your resume, looking at core competencies, minimum qualifications, requirements, um, leveraging the job posting and essentially um, maximizing your your time so that you're not applying for a bunch of jobs and not getting any hits. All right, so let's talk about the hidden job market. I want you guys to untrain your minds from thinking that of course the resume will do all of the work because it won't. That's actually only like one sixth of your marketing strategy. So we're gonna talk about the rest of that in segment three. 
But I want you to know your resume won't do all the work. We're gonna learn um, that the vast majority of candidates are applying for jobs online. So you're already at a disadvantage if you're applying online and that's your only strategy. Here's why I mentioned that. I'm gonna give you a, a, I'm gonna draw this analogy together. Follow me. So when I was younger, I was a huge fan of Michael Jordan sneakers and my cousins and I would wait hours in line for his latest release. And sometimes we would get lucky and get a pair and sometimes we'd go home empty handed. One of my cousins got a job at Foot Locker. So we had an in and the next time those Jordans were released, each of us were able to buy a pair. So I hoped you guys uh, picked up on where I was going with that analogy. If you're only applying for jobs online, that's the equivalent to waiting in line and hoping to get a pair of Jordans or in a candidate's case, hoping to get an interview. Um, applying for jobs and having an inside man of course, in this case, we're talking about my cousin who worked at Foot Locker, will give you an advantage against the others who are waiting in line. So moral of the story is don't rely on your resume to get the job. You have to actually put some work in. And now we're going to dive into the hidden job market, what it is, um, why do insiders get in, where it is, and how, I, how do I get in? So I'm going to skip over here. And I want you to know that Career Directors International, I'm also a member of that, he posted this statistic, 80% of jobs aren't publicized, and that's true. A lot of it is based on who you know and um, using LinkedIn, but not to, just to apply for jobs, but really just using that as your network, um, keeping in contact with folks like your previous manager or something along those lines. All right, so I'm going to jump in. All right. So hidden job market, what is the HMJ? I like to call it, uh, where insiders get in, where is it everywhere? <laughs> Why do insiders get in? Because they know someone that you don't and how do I get in, you network and connect. So the hidden job market is of course where insiders get hired. That's where jobs are available, but not posted online or they're not posted on your popular job boards like Indeed, LinkedIn or Glassdoor. So we're talking about why do insiders get in? Going back to my sneaker reference, it's because they know someone that you don't. They're putting in the work to cultivate those relationships and delegate some of their work to their network. Um, let's see, as an employer, um, give me one second. My slide isn't, there we go. All right, so as an employer myself, I like to um, ask the folks who are around me before I post a job on any kind of a job site. I think I asked my mom for my latest referral and I'm actually onboarding her now. So people hire people that they can trust. And that's why um, companies will pay a ton of money for referrals. For instance, State Farm, which I actually work there as well. They're offering a $1,500 bonus to any employee who refers a candidate, a good candidate that actually stays on board. So really the story is people trust people. Um, let's talk about, oh, here we go. All right, so where is the HMJ? Now that we have an idea of the HMJ, how it works, the insiders, we're gonna dig into not so much where is HMJ, but who? Who are those insiders that you can touch base with? So your previous managers, uh, recruiters, you can use LinkedIn for that. And funny enough, if you have LinkedIn Premium, just a little tidbit, the recruiters and hiring managers sometimes put their they link their accounts to the jobs that they're posting. So you can actually just reach out to them directly or figure out who their peers are in the group, or you can um, link yourself to someone in the company. And we're gonna talk about informational interviews later on. Um, other insiders might be peers that you worked with who left the company. Um, people in your network, again, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, funny enough, not a lot of folks use Facebook for their job search, but you can really get some good networking opportunities on there. Of course, the alumni network, which we have an awesome one and any kind of social media is, is what I jot, jotted down. Okay, decision makers um, at companies that you've interviewed with previously, any business organizations and any nonprofit organizations. So now we are on how do I get into the club? And I have network and connect. So you wanna become a master at cold connecting. It's kind of like cold calling. So I did some work, I did some research for you guys. 
And every individual I, I jotted down, I checked out some of the most exclusive clubs. I just literally Googled what are some of the most exclusive clubs um, to get into. And I'll tell you that what they have in common is that the candidate they're choosing needs to be interesting, interested in joining, and they had to be nominated by someone who was already a member. That's how important it is for you to actually know someone to get into wherever you're trying to go. So here are a few ideas on connecting with folks who are in your network. I'm using LinkedIn for an example. I will skip here. So you want to find the company that you want to target, for instance, like Allstate, or um, find the position at the company that you're interested in, like a claims adjuster job. Um, reach out di directly to like the director of claims or someone who's currently in the role. And here's a template that you can use if you feel, because sometimes, you know, applying for speaking to people on LinkedIn kind of seems salesy if you just pop into their inbox, you know, asking for help. But if you kind of phrase it in this, and this is something I posted on IG, if you frame it in this, hi, my name is, you know, Jen, I'm currently doing whatever your job title is. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I'd love to have a coffee chat with you. I'm interested in learning more about X, Y, and Z. And based on your experience, I felt that this would be, uh, that you'd be the best person to connect with to answer my questions. So I am going to, oops, I'll go there. Let me share. Other places to look that people don't think about for their hidden job market search are you gonna move over? It's not gonna move over. Chamber of Commerce sites. Let's see. Yeah, you'll move over here. All right. So I actually just Googled um, our Kissimmee because I'm in Florida, our Chamber of Commerce for Kissimmee. And there's a vice president job on there for equity strategy and partnerships. So there are some, and this isn't publicized anywhere else. Osceola County Board of County Commissioners, $2,000 sign-on incentive. So these are, again, just things that folks aren't, and this is, this is our Polk County Chamber of Commerce. So you can look up like Cambridge Chamber of Commerce, Chelsea Chamber of Chom uh, Commerce, just different areas that you really wouldn't think of outside of your normal Indeed. And then here's our job list that most folks don't use. My, the moral of story, stay away from just how in that being in that mindset that Indeed or LinkedIn are the only places for you to actually look for a gig. All right, we're going to get to the good stuff. Well, it's all good stuff, but all right. And so just as a recap, you guys are supposed to learn what the hidden job market is, why it's important, where to find it, and how to get in. So I am going to ask you, because it's interactive, let's test your knowledge. In the chat, answer this question, what percentage of jobs aren't publicized? So for a Starbucks gift card, whoever wins, just drop your email in the chat. What percentage of jobs aren't publicized? Go. Let's see. Yay, 80, 80, 80, 80, I love it. All right, so it looks like Amy was paying attention for sure. Amy, if you don't mind, um, hanging on so we can grab your email or if you feel comfortable you can drop it in the chat now all right i have another question for another starbucks gift card true or false the hidden job market can be found on indeed false yes awesome all right give one example of an insider Yes. Oh, I love it. You guys are paying attention. <laughs> Russell Browse in that tobacco movie. I'm not familiar. <laughs> oh, Russell Crowe. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. I'll have to watch it. Okay. All right. So we are on segment two. And we have, I have a ton of info. So hopefully I'm not going too fast, we'll see. All right, so does anyone know, oops, don't do that, what a DNQ candidate is? So we're 
for another Starbucks gift card, we are starting off with a pop quiz here. What's a DNQ candidate? Anyone? You guys are like, no, I have no idea. <laughs> All right. A DNQ candidate, that means does not qualify. Oh, Rich. Okay. Heather, did you Google that? <laughs> All right, Heather, I will, I'll, I'll give you that. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So Starbucks gift card goes to Heather. I don't know if it's a good guess or you just knew either way. Congrats. All right. So does not qualify. So this is a feature that recruiters have in their applicant tracking software, and it automatically kicks you out if you don't meet the desired criteria. For example, the job posting asks specifically for Microsoft office products. And the recruiter only wants to see candidates who are fairly experienced in that. They have some sort of idea of what Excel is, et cetera. Um, they'll essentially create a box for anyone who does not have that experience. It's called a does not qualify um, box for anyone that is, let's say, under one year. They can get really specific with it. So any candidate who doesn't have that qualification, they're automatically knocked out of the running. So my mission, of course, is to help you become, we want to stay away from that, that DNQ candidate status. So keep in mind, the best way to be ATS is to actually be qualified for the job. <laughs> if you're actually qualified here, three must-haves to avoid being a DNQ. So you need to know how to read a job description. You need to know ATS rules of engagement, and you need to know how to exploit keywords to your advantage. All right, so let's focus on reading the job description. I'm gonna, sh I'll show you one and show you how it connects to the resume shortly. So job descriptions are gonna feature everything um, from the job title, of course, uh, which is, let's see, the summary of the role, company descriptions, any minimum requirements, um, experience required section, skills, core competencies, responsibilities, um, here. Am I missing anything? Okay, so let's go through each one of them. All right, the job title. Of course, you need to include this in your resume. Most people don't. You can do so in two places. Write this down. When you're saving your document, you want to make sure that you have, for instance, my last name is McDuffie. It'll be McDuffie underscore Janiel underscore fraud underscore invest, um, investigator. So you're telling me, I'm telling whoever is looking at this that I'm applying for a fraud investigator job that they posted, and that I'm also going to put fraud investigator as my target um, in the objective area of my resume. All right, so for the summary of the role, you wanna pay attention to those words that repeat. Also, every verb leads to a keyword or a key phrase. So find a verb, and right after that, it's gonna tell you what keyword is important. All right, company descriptions. This is where all the juice is. <laughs> it gives you insight into the environment that, that uh, you're gonna be working in. So that'll help you essentially to align your transferable skills with their culture. For example, they might say working in a fast paced environment, definitely something that you wanna include in your resume. Um, working on a multicultural team, if you're team oriented or they're really big on teamwork, that's definitely something that you wanna add in your resume. All right, so the minimum requirements in the requirements section, that's gonna be your education, any certifications or must have technology strengths. Um, the experience required section, they might say a minimum of 10 years required. In that case, if you have the experience, you wanna put that in your summary, like in the first sentence, no lower than the second sentence. So it'll say something like accomplished fighter <laughs> with 20 years of experience doing X, Y, and Z. You want to put that up front so that the recruiter is like, okay, I, I want to read this person's resume, essentially, because they may have, may or may not have the skills that I'm looking for. And they only have six seconds on average. That's how long they take to look at a resume. So if you give them the target and you give them the number of years of experience, especially if they're not getting it from other candidates and they're getting it from you, you're already going to be a step above the competition. All right. So we're going to talk about skills and core competencies. Um, if you don't know communication, leadership, adaptability, cross-functional collaboration, those are um, examples of core competencies. And of course, your responsibility section is what you're going to be doing. So you want to look at that and see how you can draw parallels between your current position and where you want to go. I am 
Hang on a second, let me try to drag this over here. No, because why would that work? Hmm. There we go. Zoom. All right. So here's a job type or job position or job posting that I was looking at the other day. So it's for a claim special investigator. If you can't tell, I'm a fraud investigator because this is the first thing that I went to um, at Frontline Insurance. So this right here is what you need to put in your target and also in as your document title. So for the summary, they mentioned special investigator. SIU, that's important. Um, claims, background, investigative research. These are some things that are going to pop up. And now if you find the verb investigating, right after it comes claims, compiling, right after it comes reports, communicating, internal, external customers, those are gonna be keywords. Um, developing and delivering training, keyword. Um, Anti-fraud may or may not be a keyword, but since it's SIU, you'll want to or SIU is Special Investigative Unit, the fraud department of the insurance company, essentially. So yes, they're gonna be anti-fraud, maybe something that you wanna consider adding, property claims, um, recorded interviews. These are all gonna be keywords. So they're coming right after the verb, scene investigations, complete neighborhood canvases, sound judgment. So all of these in yellow or orangish, those are gonna to wanna to be things that you're going to um, add to your keyword section of your resume, or I like to call it your skills and technical proficiencies or my catch-all. All right, so anything else on here that I want to, core competencies, reasoning ability. They've already told you that you need reason, reasoning ability. Mathematical skills isn't technically a core competency, but since they're mentioning on there, you, you may wanna add something about your math skills. Same thing with language skills, ability to read and comprehend instructions. You may want to take a look at this area. You're probably not gonna write on your resume that you know how to read or comprehend instructions, but if there is something like writing correspondence, um, presenting information in a one-on-one -on -one or group situation, um, working with customers or clients, other employees, those are some things that you should consider. And of course, for the education section, here we go. Well, they need this, of course, it's required, they told you. And designations such as AICCPCU, but you must have five years of investigative or claims experience, as well as areas of coverage, et cetera. So the recruiter likely has put in their system for DNQ, if they have four years, kick them out. So. I don't wanna say don't waste your time applying for a position that you may or may not be qualified for, but just be aware that you may get bumped just for not having that experience or not sharing that in your resume. All right, now I can go back here. Just like this. That's okay. All right. Customizing your resume for each role. So let me that. All right. So you need to know your ATS rules of engagement, is what I like to call it. So Showcasing, of course, the tenure without adding irrelevant work experience. We're gonna talk about that. Um, your tenses, plurals, you wanna write like the job description. We're gonna talk about that. Add the job title. We already talked about that. Just as a heads up, recommended work board count for professional resumes is typically between 500 to 700. Um, quantifiable achievements, we'll talk about that. Formatting your dates, this is so important. We'll talk about that too, okay. So if you don't wanna list a job on your resume, but you still want credit for the years, you can do, 
I'm just going to drag this in here if you'll let me. Okay, I'll show you that after because it's just going to be a pain in the butt. You can create a prior positions of note, and I will show you what it looks like on the resume. So let's just say you were doing, you're a fraud investigator, you, you were doing it for like 10 years. And then all of a sudden you just stopped being a fraud investigator. You felt like, okay, I want to go drive for Uber. For whatever reason, you want to go be a fry cook, whatever have you. You don't have, so you, it's your, your experience is not, um, let's say 10 years or sorry, 15 years of fraud investigation. Right after you're done being a fry cook, you decide to go back, get another five years. So you have 10 years, gap, five years. But you want to show that you have 15 years of total experience without having that gap in there. You can keep the gap. You just have to know how to show it on your resume that you still had a job during that time. And I'm going to show you how to do that once I pull up my um, handy dandy resume over here. It's fancy, guys. I'll show you in a second. All right, so ATS will not be able to find different tenses or plurals of a word. So the rule of thumb is to write exactly how the job description says. So if the job description says adaptability, don't write adaptable. You have to actually write it as adaptability or it won't count it as a term that has been met. So let's see here. We recommend also writing your exact title on the, on the, um, on your resume, for instance, fraud investigator. Otherwise, it's not going to recognize that you're going to be qualified and you won't be considered for that job. Recommended word count is 500 to 700. We already talked about that. Um, if you do have over 10 years of experience, and let's just say you're going for like a federal position, totally different. You can, your federal resume is actually supposed to be the entire, like your entire career. They want all of your business. Um, if you're an executive, some folks can go up to three pages for executive positions. For instance, if you've, you've been a president of a company or president of a couple of companies and you just have that much experience that you want to share, then you can go up to three pages. But my standard is two. Um, one, of course, if you're like a college graduate, like you're fresh out of college and you really have no experiences, then you want to go with one page. But if you were very active in college and let's say you had, um, you had, a job in college and let's say you were in a bunch of different clubs you're president of this etc you may be able to go two pages just make sure it's a full two pages because it looks weird if it's one page and then like a half um all right quantifiable achievements let's see someone's entering quantifiable achievements are essential and the ats actually tracks that so some applicant tracking software will say okay she has 10 situations where there are numbers associated with her resume. I'll show you what it looks like on the resume in a second. Um, sometimes uh, the ATS system, when it comes to the dates, it will not track if you have, for instance, June 2020 to this word right here, September 2022. Like it just won't do it. You have to write it with a dash. Do not ask me why. It just doesn't recognize it. It cannot do the math on how many years of experience you have. So, and this should go without saying, but you would be surprised how many clients I get that do this. Your resume should have no personal pronouns, but sometimes I see resumes and it's like, I am an accomplished, da, 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 da. like you're writing full sentences. Your resume is supposed to be truncated. And because it's about yourself, it's redundant for you to have any one of these pronouns, I or me, in your resume. So now I'm gonna show you what the resume actually looks like. please. Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay, so this is Bryn Brandley. All right, so we talked about having the 
well, the industry. She wants to be in e-commerce and the actual job that she's applying for. So director of procurement and category management. First sentence tells you how many years she's been doing it, 18 years. Um, she has, looks like, in the first half of her page, we have to maximize that because if a recruiter only has six seconds, they're only gonna get to read just about maybe to right here. If their interest is peaked, you might get them to read down here. So I have to, in six seconds, or the first half of the first page, tell them that you can do, you can work magic. <laughs> um, so generating a 10% increase in a failing category, increasing a margin by 15%. Um, and these can be quick hitters. They don't have, you don't have to go into like a whole elaborate explanation as to what, what you did during the role, but you definitely wanna give them some numbers to show that you know what you're doing essentially. Um, increasing performance, building relationships, driving results, leading teams. Those are some of the competence, competencies that we're aligning with the director of procurement and category management position, um, propelling revenue growth, et cetera. So here is a mix of your hard and soft skills. So you have like sourcing, vendor relations, um, team leadership would be a soft skill, um, relationship building, also a soft skill, forecasting, category management, those are gonna be hard skills and then your professional experience. Here we go again with more of those quantifiable achievements. And so here, um, Bryn ran into a situation where we said 18 years of experience, but then of course her resume is only showing 2012. So it's only what, 10 years barely of experience. So we wanted to give her credit for the remainder for years. So we created that position, the prior positions of note section and added her replenisher job down here. So it gives her credit all the way back to 2004. ATS will pick up on that. Um, and of course your education and typically this section right here is higher on the resume. However, we had all these things to feature and I just decided as the uh, professional resume writer that this would be the best place for it. So, and while I'm on this topic, there are five key sections that you need in a resume. If you do not know, you have your contact section, your summary section, your skills and technical proficiencies and your work experience and of course your education. All right, so I'm gonna see, shrink this back down. Okay. Okay, so how do we know which keywords are going to be important? Oh, and I have to tell you all about the six month rule. This is gonna be good. You're, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, I had no clue. All right, so we'll start with the six month rule. We just looked at the resume and we looked at the summary section of the resume. I should have probably kept it on there. If you have any competencies or skills listed in that summary section, it, the applicant tracking software will only give you six months worth of experience for whatever you have in that summary section because it's not tied to a specific job. That's why it's recommended that if you put anything in the summary, you also have to put it in your work experience. Tell me if that makes sense. Put it in the chat, tell me right now if that makes sense. Yes or no? Amy said yes, Luann said yes. Yes, 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 awesome. All right, so that means that let's just say I put communications five times in my summary, it needs to be also in my last or most current position, of course, if you use communications, um, because it's gonna give you the entire length of your tenure. So if you had this job doing communications for the last 10 years, then the ATS is gonna say, Janelle's been doing this job, and communications has been her focus for the last 10 years versus getting six, month, six months of experience. Okay, hard skills, soft skills. We talked about that briefly. Just to go over it, hard skills are your technical skills, computer skills, Microsoft Office skills, anything analytical, marketing, presentation skills, management, project management, et cetera. Soft skills are leadership skills, teamwork, communication skills, problem solving, work ethic, um, 
flexibility, adaptability, interpersonal skills. So I didn't talk to you guys about word clouds, um, using word clouds to find keywords. That same job posting I showed you earlier with the fraud, I pulled keywords. I hope you guys can see this. I'll try to make it bigger. There, that's better. So I pulled some keywords. You can ignore the first one, of course, ability, because it's gonna say like ability to climb a ladder. We don't care about that word. However, investigation, insurance, with I guess a capital I, insurance with a lowercase I and investigator, those are some words that you want to weave into your resume as many times as you can, because they're, yeah, they're prevalent on the job posting. So you wanna, as many times as you can, say investigator, insurance, investigation, of course, if you have the experience. If you're an airline pilot and trying to put in insurance, it's probably not gonna work. But if you can, definitely include that. Anybody have questions on word clouds? And I'll um, drop some links in at the end. No questions? There, there was one question um, if it was a good idea to put a profile pic on the resume. No, we'll come back to that. <laughs> That's a great question. I want to dig into that. I actually just had a conversation about this yesterday. All right, so, well, we've already answered this. I want to say Heather got the gift card for that. So, all right, we are going to mosey on over to running your job search as a marketing campaign. So this is segment three, of course. And we're gonna start by looking at what your campaign will actually look like. Boom, okay. So how much time should you spend job searching? Here's an outline of your full job search marketing campaign. You're gonna create a schedule, determine how much time you can reasonably dedicate to job searching. You can identify your target audience and write effective copy, which is going to be your resume, essentially. Group your applications together based on the jobs that you're targeting. Develop your media strategy um, using informational interviews to build relationships within your target company. Um, let's see. Also identify other connections that may be beneficial to your search. Implement your marketing campaign. So connecting with those insiders virtually or in person uh, using conventional methods or social media. So it's okay to just pick up the phone and call someone and say, hey, I want to meet with you or emailing them. That's totally fine. And go meet them for coffee. Um, and if you want to reach out to my social media, I would, without sounding salesy, yes, I would connect with them. And of course, you want to measure and analyze your results. All right. So this is what a job search schedule can look like. And I recommend to all of my clients that they have a schedule because you don't want to just sit there all day and apply for a thousand jobs and not get anywhere with it. So for instance, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., you can review five to 10 jobs that you're interested in and make sure that you're keeping track of these. You want to have an Excel worksheet or a Word document or somewhere that you can track this info so you know that you've already have one have already applied for the job. Um, if you have and you already have it on your Excel worksheet, you'd be surprised how many people are applying for the same job over and over again because they're like, oh, I see this, I'm interested. And then five days later, they're like, oh, this looks like a cool job. All right, so 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., you want to identify the jobs that are closest in content. So for instance, a project manager, um, product manager, those might not be, oh, I already have it on here. For example, a product manager job, um, that should be grouped with a project manager job if it's, if it's close enough. They do two separate things, but there are some competencies that cross over. So you're not having to reframe your entire resume for job A and job B. Take a lunch break and take breaks in between. That's important. So job searching is literally like a full-time job. So you want to, of course, 1230 to 230, read your job descriptions, identify all those minimum qualifications, requirements, et cetera, that we already talked about, um, and select appropriate examples from um, let's say your, your current resume or previous positions that you've had, making sure that you're applying those competencies from the job description, using those examples and start framing your resume out that way. So 2.45 to 4.30, because you can take a break in between there. 
Once you've customized your resume and you're ready to start applying, make sure that you create a Word document with common application questions because it is so annoying to have to go from one application to the next. You've asked me this question, um, tell me why you want the job, et cetera. And you've already given your answer, but you wrote your answer in whatever form they have. And now you have to go answer the same question again. <laughs> again, on the next application. So keep a Word document. That's just my tidbit for common applications that you run across and that will save you so much time. All right. So identifying your target audience, this is gonna be a real quickie. So in order to group your applications together, of course, you need to know who your target audience is, which we just briefly talked about and informational interviews. I mean, we're gonna get here soon. So when we're talking about developing your media strategy, or in this case, your job search strategy, informational interviews are a must do. Has anyone ever done an informational interview? Drop it in the chat, yes or no? Awesome, Amy's done one. No, no, yes, yes, no, no. Okay, so we typically get mostly no's because some folks are like, what in the world is an informational interview? So honestly, they're easily <clears throat> the most underused career strategy. So in short, it's a job shadow for a company or role that you're interested in. I found, again, that many of my clients just don't have a clue what this is or how to approach it, what to say, what to ask, what not to ask, et cetera. So the key to having a successful informational interview session is one, never ask for a job. Two, use the time that you have to learn more about the job. Any um, key, let's see here, any key technology that they use. Um, if there's a certain certification, like you saw on the fraud investigator, they had a bunch of stuff like CPCU, AIC. I know from um, being in insurance for 15 years, you'll need like some jobs might require like a CLU, which is like chartered life underwriter. So if, if someone were coming to me, I would want to let them know that this is going to be a requirement for the job. And here's how you go about getting the certification. That's the type of stuff you talk about in informational interviews. You want to keep the conversations short, of course, to make sure that you're not um, using up, I don't want to say using up everyone's time, but keep it short just as a courtesy. And of course, make sure that you always send a thank you note. All right, this is just uh, something that you should know, really. 95% of recruiters are looking for job candidates on LinkedIn. So you still have your hidden job market, right? But recruiters are looking, they're using your LinkedIn and you wanna make sure that your LinkedIn is flawless. So how do you create a higher ready presence on LinkedIn? So we're gonna implement your marketing campaign, of course, with your higher ready, um, higher ready online presence. You wanna make sure that your LinkedIn is updated, meaning of course you're up, you wanna update your summary, your work experience, headline and skills. And if you need help, I can help with this. I love doing LinkedIn profiles. It's really my jam. Um, you wanna remove, and as, as far as social media in general, remove any inappropriate photos or statuses like on your IG, um, your Facebook, even your TikTok. TikTok resumes are a thing and people are actually using that to find candidates. So um, you'll want to use your LinkedIn. Hang on one sec. Right, give me one second. You'll want to use your LinkedIn to engage new connections, of course, and make sure that your LinkedIn is eye-catching. So I like to create custom backgrounds for LinkedIn and I use Canva to do that. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Canva. Tell me if you've heard of Canva in the chat. Yes, Amy, you are on it, girl. Okay, no, no, no. Okay, so this, it's a, it's a, a design platform and it's really, really easy to use. So if you want to, that's my secret sauce to LinkedIn backgrounds. You can go on there, punch in email backgrounds and you'll, um, you'll be able to customize it to whatever you want. I absolutely love using Canva for that. And good thing is we are wrapping up shortly. So the last piece to it is measure and analyze your results. Again, you wanna keep track of the postings, the salaries, the benefits, the locations, keep track of the number of um, applicant, 
well, applications submitted, keep track of your industries, any callbacks, any interviews, um, keep track of everything that you can keep track of for, for your job search. Now, if you've applied to over 15 positions and you're not getting any hits or you've been interviewed, but you're not getting hired, it would be wise for you to reach out to a career services professional. And I'd be more than willing to help you um, create your job search strategy. Um, same thing with your LinkedIn. I'm definitely here to help for that. Like I said, that is my jam. So, all right. I am all done. I'm pretty sure. Oh, come on, slide. No. Okay, my slide doesn't want to work. Again. There you go. Here's my contact info. If you want to text, if you feel more comfortable texting, you can do that. 407 602 5511. My email address is on here. The website's on here. And all of my social channels, I am at the resume check. Any questions? Uh, Jen, just coming back to that question about photos on resumes. Yes. No, do not put your photo on a resume. So typically um, in European countries, they'll do that. To this day, I still don't know why. But in the United States of America, you do not want to do that. It opens up so much bias, especially with this diversity, equity, inclusion drive that we have going on right now with most companies. It might seem like a cool thing to do. I do not suggest doing it. Oh, hold on, it's a can bug. background. Other questions, this is a great chance to, to get Jen's input. Sorry, I'm like answering chat questions. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, don't put your photo on the resume, don't do it. Okay, appropriate to ask for feedback if you don't get hired after one or two interviews. Um, Heather, email me. Yes, I think that's a good email question. We can probably just get on the phone and, and talk about it. Um, you're welcome. Anyone else? No questions? Okay, yeah, I, I had a lot of info jam-packed in this segment. If you guys need anything, have any questions, there's my contact info. Um, I look forward to giving out those gift cards. So if you signed up, Cecile, yes, I can do an information session by phone. Um, if you signed up, well, if you won a Starbucks gift card, send me, you can send it to me individually, I believe your email address, and then I can send it right to your email. And actually, um, Jen, just a quick question. There's one here about, do you recommend answering diversity questions that go along with the application or can you, what do you think about preferring not I to always, answer? I always answer them. I really, and what's, I what's, your think, them. what's your thinking on that? Um, it really is mostly just to keep track of um, the diversity that's coming in so that folks can say like, okay, my company has like 30% minorities. I don't usually have an issue with those questions. I don't mm -hmm. think that there's anything that goes against this. I really think that they're just, the company's just using it for their statistics. Okay. Thanks, Luann. Great. Uh, well, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, Cecile just asked my business hours. Mm -hmm. um, it's typically nine to five, but honestly, I do work a lot after hours. So you can honestly just text me and we can, we can hop on the phone. Great. Um, Jen, thank you so much. There's some really good and different tips here, especially I think the staying organized parts um, is important. And you gave us tips for the whole process, um, really understanding that it is important to do networking, um, thinking about your branding, thinking about the effectiveness of your resumes. And I like that idea of grouping your different jobs so you can save time on having your customized uh, resume and things like that. Um, thank you for your willingness to share your expertise. I will put in a little plug for our end source networking platform and and also in my role um, at Northeastern's alumni office, I also do um, provide some coaching sessions for alumni as well. And the career development office, career design, provides career coaching for those within seven years of graduation and for me beyond as well. 
Um, but thank you all. These were great questions. Um, I hope you put these tips yeah. into action. And Jen, thanks for sharing the latest and greatest news from the, the resume and job search world. Awesome. Well, anytime you guys have questions, again, call me, text me, beat me, um, email me, <laughs> email me, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks, Cecile. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the gift cards to the winners. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Don't forget to drop your email addresses in. I got one from Amy, but I know there are like three other winners. If you're still on, send me those emails. Okay, I'll drop my email. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm done. laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I'm Excellent. signing off. Thanks, Thank everyone. You Thank, Thank you, Jen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.